thank you for inviting me, and thank you all for being here. But it's windy outside, and uh, walking around would be somehow not advisable, and therefore this might be a good reason for you to remain here for some more minutes. <laughs> uh, also because I'm, uh, I'm aware, and Fred uh, is aware uh, with me, that uh, the topic is not so regional. I mean, in these days, all of us are thinking of, uh, uh, of the crisis. But it may be useful, though, to uh, reflect, uh, uh, let's say, here, uh, uh, outside, uh, out of the rooms where decisions are being taken, because decisions are in these days uh, under the pressure of domestic demands, which might lead to uh, 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 at least momentarily forgetting that these problems are really global. And one of my points will be that the old doctrine according to which, which is valid in itself and remains valid, putting our own house in order is the prerequisite and the solution in my view, it is the prerequisite, but it's not the solution, because it's a piece of the solution. And therefore, let us think about uh, this uh, enormous uh, theme uh, somehow free of the uh, uh, daily pressures that governments uh, are uh, confronting with in, in these days. Uh, I will say something briefly on the causes of the crisis, not because I want to go back to the uh, uh, analysis of what happened. We have read hundreds of analyses of what happened, but in relation to the therapy that we have to found, because depending on the elements that you underline most uh, of the sequence of the facts that brought to the crisis, you have in mind the therapy instead of another. And I will refer to the uh, 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 facts uh, 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 having this in mind. Uh, second, uh, what uh, uh, basically the US and Europe can do, uh, in their respective responsibilities and, the, and also in the exercise of their common responsibilities uh, in the wider global arena. Now, the causes of the crisis, to make it very short and talking to people who are probably even more aware than I am about them, uh, uh, I see uh, this kind of uh, uh, retrospective view in, in the following terms. Uh, I, I can't see the crisis as only due to uh, real economy uh, uh, shortcomings uh, or only due to financial activities shortcoming. And uh, uh, the fact that there has been and there is an ongoing debate on, well, but the fundamental reasons are much more important than the proximate financial reasons is uh, an argument uh, that intentionally or not leads to uh, uh, somehow uh, putting aside the enormous responsibilities that exist in relation to what has happened in the financial sector. Uh, I have had uh, uh, sort of confrontations with other well, but I mean, it's obvious. Uh, there was a surplus uh, uh, in China and somebody ha else had to be uh, in deficit. And therefore, the solution, the problem is this unbalance, and the solution is correcting the unbalance. I mean, this is true. Certainly, it, it, it is true. It is a fact that after the financial crisis of the 90s, the Asian economies became much more let's say, circumspect in uh, uh, getting uh, uh, loans from outside, started saving and reducing their own domestic investments and uh, uh, became exporters of uh, uh, financial resources. This is a fact. I mean, it is also a fact that if there is a surplus, there have to be deficits. It is also a fact that the under-evaluation of the RMBB 
has played a role in all uh, of these matters. But having said so, one might wonder why it was here in this country that mostly the financial crisis came out. And here, uh, I have read the explanation, well, because here the innovation was highest, the financial innovation was highest. If we call whatever has happened innovation, okay, I accept it. <laughs> <laughs> and for sure, there was a lot of innovation. But, I mean, if this has happened here, is because here only let's say, uh, 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 the decision was taken one way or another that if you cannot increase my purchasing power by rising my income, you rise <coughs> my debts. And <coughs> due to this decision, Several people who were not supposed to became homeowners and the mortgage-backed securities became a, one of the main titles of the financial market. It was <coughs> due to this fact and to other facts such as all of the banks bound by Basel II that bypass <coughs> the limits of Basel II and start investing the new way by using innovative means in violation of the Basel II criteria but outside the formal area where the Basel II criteria applied. This was called innovation. And the central banks accepted it as innovation. I have to be very candid. I have to be very candid. It was accepted as innovation. Most of the titles, <laughs> the value of which is a present puzzle for our <coughs> banks and now also for our finance ministers, were negotiated over the counter which is something that in no market is admissible. Because any serious price has to be negotiated and has to come out of the, let's say, confrontation between uh, demand and offer. And it has to be transparent. These prices were not transparent. I was... <coughs> discussing days ago the same issue with other friends and uh, I went back to uh, the years uh, uh, of my first experience as Minister of the Treasury in Italy when I found my bonds, my, I mean, Treasury bonds, negotiated the same way by a few Italian banks. There were telephone calls the day before they decided privately <coughs> on what price they were ready to buy or to sell, and this was it. And the, now, I set up a commission uh, which led to a decree that changed the system, doing what? Creating the market, the secondary market for our public bonds. That became one of the most efficient markets in Europe for uh, <coughs> public bonds. Now, we called that transformation creation of the market for, which means that before it was not a market. And therefore we have allowed million, million, million of euros, dollars, etc., to be negotiated out of the market in the name of a free economy, a free market economy. Now, there are responsibilities for this, and they have to be uh, uh, taken seriously. Not to speak 
of the uh, rating. Of course, I'm well aware that uh, the defense of the rating agency is, well, but if, if after securitization, it is impossible for me from far away to have a clear assessment and understanding of the risk inherent to each title or to each piece of the title eh, after uh, the dicing uh, 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 and consequently putting together di different pieces. Okay, fine. So why don't you refuse to uh, grade these titles? Because it's impossible for you to, to give a credible value. But you did give values to these titles. Why? So there were triple A's given to unknown titles. So these are all facts. And uh, I, I simply uh, want uh, to uh, take them into the picture, not because I'm convinced that only by putting remedies to these financial non-market uh, failures uh, we solve our problem, but because this is part of the wider problem, and because the uh, enormous uh, intensity of the damage was due to the globalized uh, interactions uh, 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 inside the, the financial markets, non-market uh, itself. And therefore, we have to look for therapies piece by piece, piece by piece. First, and I go back to the uh, real economy causes, we have a problem uh, to solve in relation to uh, our real economies. Something that has to be clear and that we cannot go back to a world where there is one only economy uh, driving the world for all. This is unsafe, first of all, for that country and for that economy. So the uh, global economy based on the single driver is something that we should abandon for the future and the healthy economic system for the future is a system where there are more drivers. I don't know whether this has something to do with the multipolar world, with the unipolar minus world, with the unipolar plus. I know that we need other economies and not only the American one, driving, co-driving the system. In other words, producing more and consuming more. Also because, and this should be clear, I think it's being clarified day after day in this country that, I repeat, if there is somebody who cannot afford going back to the past, this is exactly the United States. Because you cannot go back to a system whereby it's by increasing debts that you uh, uh, enhance the purchasing power. It's a formidable challenge for all of us. Already this one. For the US, for, U for China, for Europe. China has to do it. And what is happening in these days with million people abandoning the cities where they were manpower for industrial productions that are going down, going back million people to the countryside. This might create an explosive situation in China that not even that Communist Party, the only serious Communist Party, quotation marks, that has remained in the world that can really handle also a serious communist party might uh, uh, be not enough to uh, uh, react to the social unrest that might uh, come out of the uh, uh, deep downturn uh, uh, of their economy. So for China, and they are starting to do it, 
uh, changing their mind, not only uh, exporting, but producing also for domestic consumption is something that is healthy for China and is healthy for, for the world. Uh, I, I mean, uh, let us uh, spend just one word on Africa. For Africa, there is no problem. The problem is producing more and consuming more anyway. So they have nothing to change. They have to react to the fact that, of course, uh, the downturn for them is, first of all, the reduction in prices of commodities that they are selling. And uh, 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 it's reacting to this. And they need, of course, they need, we, we cannot ask to them, uh, don't export uh, and uh, 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 enhance your domestic demand. They, they are entitled to do both. They have to find free channels of international trade for their products today even more than in the past. Today and even more than in the past. And this is the way for them to increase also domestic demand. For Europe, for, for the US, it's a formidable challenge in my view. Because after all, uh, it, it, it would be uh, unfair to discuss the uh, mismatch between the disposable income and in, uh, the uh, uh, propensity to indebtedness, uh, which is typical of this country, ignoring the fact that for several American families, most of the disposable income produced by them goes to satisfying basic needs that in Europe are satisfied differently. Health and education. I can understand an average American family that after, uh, 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 let's say, health coverage and saving or spending for the education of the children have to use that to, uh, to buy what is needed. So here I see the formidable challenge and the connection between the economic recovery program and the social program of the new administration. And uh, I understand that the fiscal stimulus comes first. It is quite obvious that it comes first. But more sooner than later, also the uh, necessary improvements uh, of the health system should arrive. Because this has to do with the reasons of the crisis. Because you cannot, let's say, indefinitely increase incomes. But you can increase the disposable income, the share of it that can be spent for consumptions. There, are, there is not only the reduction of taxes to uh, attain this kind uh, uh, of result. There is also spending less in what is costing too much. I'm impressed of the fact that the US is the country where, health, where for health the highest share of GDP is spent. Of, uh, our en entire Western world, and so many families are without it. There is something that has to be corrected. There is something that has to be corrected, and not only here. For Europe, the challenge is no less <coughs> formidable. Producing more and consuming more. Now here, I see two basic difficulties that are emerging in Europe. The first one <coughs> is a traditional difficulty of Europe that was uh, enhanced uh, after the uh, last enlargement. I think all of you remember that before the introduction of the Euro, Several American economists who didn't like the Euro, I don't know the reason why they did not, those of them who didn't like, like the Euro, were repeatedly warning us, listen, 
You have decided to limit yourselves to a coordination of your economic and fiscal policies. And therefore, you won't avail yourself of uh, automatic stabilizers uh, uh, centrally uh, uh, planned and centrally used. Therefore, it will be difficult for you to withstand asymmetric shocks should they arrive. Uh, you are not a federal state, and therefore, uh, I mean, you'd better, somebody concluded, uh, give it up with the idea of the single currency. Not all of them reached this conclusion. For sure, the analysis was correct. We were not uh, equipping our community of uh, uh, stabilizers that a central authority could use in case of unbalancing uh, crisis. Our response was, and it was quite a correct answer, but there is a process of convergence of our economies which will uh, preempt that kind of risk. Uh, economies that basically converge cannot remain victim of asymmetric shocks. There might be a generalized downturn or, which was a correct answer in principle. The fact is that I'm have always supported the commission that was the Prodi Commission in its effort to uh, enlarge the Union as soon as possible and therefore I don't object to the fact that 10 new countries entered in 2003-04 uh, uh, simultaneously. But the fact of the matter is that the rate of convergence of the uh, economies of the member states was reduced at that point. That some of them were really uh, at a lower level. Which of course has created internal um, imbalances due to which in, in a situation like this one, the trend is or the temptation is let us, each of us, mind his own business. Because if my industries in this difficult moment keep delocalizing their plans in the member states where labor is cheaper, where environmental standards are not uh, so high as they are here, etc., well, uh, I will be losing something that I cannot afford now to lose. And here, the protectionist reaction, protectionist inside the community reaction, might emerge as a defense against the existing divergences inside. In uh, the good years, uh, you can also accept that one of your industries uh, goes to Romania. In the bad years, this is much more difficult uh, to accept. And therefore, you say, I am ready <coughs> to give a hand to my industries as long as they produce in my country and don't delocalize anywhere else. So this is what might emerge now. <clears throat> With Emma Bonino, I've written an article that was published yesterday against this temptation. At the moment, it has not uh, uh, emerged as more than a temptation. But in France, uh, perhaps it is already more than a temptation. And it could extend more widely. We already have seen British workers asking British employees for British jobs. Uh, if we don't succeed in 
preserving the integrity of our common market, I doubt that we will succeed in making Europe more productive and more successful in increasing its domestic demand. We might see individual countries do it for a while, but we have an experience already. You should all remember that uh, antitrust was suspended and uh, something of protectionist flavor was introduced both in the 30s in the US and uh, in the 90s in Japan. In both cases, the studies that have been done afterwards have clearly demonstrated that there are short-term benefits, but long-term costs. That any kind of protectionist measure preserves the uh, in, um, government and the political majority of the moment from uh, uh, untenable forms of social unrest, but they delay the end of the recession. That's all. And like it or not, I mean, this is also obvious. And uh, it's not even necessary to give economic expla ex explanations of it. So these are formidable uh, uh, challenges, I said. And it is extremely important for uh, our countries to take care of these uh, domestic issues. I consider Europe domestic. I don't think that Italy is my domestic business. Europe is my domestic business. And uh, the more Italy and France and Germany understand that this is, has to be for them the meaning of domestic, uh, the better for them, uh, uh, for each of them and, uh, and for Europe. But having done all of these things, also something else remains that has to do uh, with two elements. One is what has to be fixed in the regulation of financial activities. I, I, I won't enter into this. There are already tons of proposals of how to improve these regulations. For sure, for sure, the past self-restraint, both of rules and regulators, is a nonsense. I, I want to say this very clearly because uh, when I read, and I had to read it, decisions of the Security Exchange Commission, decision of the Supreme Court, in which these supreme authorities were stating that financial activities are too complex and technically difficult to be regulated from outside, and it is much better self-regulation on the one side and therefore self-restraint of the other, I am forced to think that the conclusion of this entire matter was a great cheater following the example of the Italian Ponzi. And nobody will make it credible that this is something so complex that no uh, public authority can seriously enter into it because it's even more complicated than biology, physics, uh, anthropology, mathematics, etc. Uh, I mean, the Italian Ponzi <coughs> well, applied a very simple scheme. And most of the derivatives, this is my frank opinion, are Ponzi multiplied for the pieces that were put together. Now, this is something, therefore, that has to be regulated according to the same rules that apply to uh, any other market. I was reading titles today, all of us are becoming socialists, uh, of course, uh, uh, looking at public property that is spreading around, I understand that we are running some risk, but certainly, we are, we are not becoming socialists if we subject financial activities to the same rules that apply to any other free market. And this has to be done. This has to be done. But this has to be done also keeping in mind that financial activities also have a multiplier that is due to the global horizon, 
that they have assumed. And therefore, what in jargon we call this, the systemic effect has to be taken care of by reviewing what kind of governance might exist beyond the national regulations and the national regulators that have to improve their standards and also their patterns when <coughs> working <coughs> on, uh, on their activities. Because I remain, if you want, loyal to the idea that uh, finance uh, has a dimension that has a sort of uh, tendency toward instability. And therefore, and as somebody calls it, an anchor of stability that we might rely upon that might be the antidote of uh, uh, instability uh, uh, waves that may occur even in a system where there is a better regulation and, and, and more attention by national regulators because these are activities that actually are innovative, that produce their effects very fastly, where capital moves so quickly and therefore, instability is inherent somehow to it. And we cannot expect that uh, unless regulations are so intrusive as to make it impossible, and this would be the opposite mistake, and this would be the opposite mistake, something is needed somehow we can resort to to improve the level of stability. Now, here, uh, even though I'm one of those who reacts negatively when uh, 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 titles appear such as we need a new Bretton Wood because I don't know what new means and when I don't know what new means uh, uh, I immediately uh, defend myself because uh, something uh, uh, unacceptable might pass through it but certainly, certainly, uh, we have to take note uh, of the fact uh, that uh, a market-led monetary system does not work. <laughs> that what happened after the rupture of the first Bretton Woods created so many incentives to instability that we cannot imagine that nobody has to care about uh, the monetary side of our uh, financial world. And, uh, and, uh, and therefore, therefore, we here have to open the other chapter. What do we want to do? at the global level with the existing institutions, with the monetary fund, with the World Bank, etc. I know that we have been discussing of reform of the international financial architecture for more than 20 years without getting anywhere. But now we have the following elements, that the IMF had abandoned its mission. Perhaps it was a mission impossible after the rupture of Bretton Woods, but it was completely abandoned. They, they had surveillance uh, in relation to monetary interactions and interrelations uh, almost completely disappeared. They passed to macroeconomic stability. They passed to caring about countries in need of their resources. They arrived some years ago to considering the financial health of the world as a relevant topic for them. But as we well know, the US and China remained beyond their horizon. Somebody wrote, you did it, you and Fulcher did it, that it was like, it was like showing Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark, something like that, something like that. So, I mean, 
we have to reconsider these things. Another formidable challenge. Another formidable challenge. Because it's not easy. Personally, I, I don't think that we can imagine a monetary fund having a, a supervision on fin financial activities that remain and, 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 and monetary uh, interactions that remain under uh, others' jurisdiction. But certainly, going back to a tough and uh, widened horizon of surveillance in close connections with the uh, uh, central banks uh, 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 or, or, or the main central banks that have the instruments that the IMF cannot be equipped with could already be a formidable step forward. And I'm also thinking, sorry for our executive directors in these institutions, that the proposal of having boards directly composed by members of the government instead of by officials of the treasuries of the bank is not necessarily a bad idea because it was uh, uh, advanced by whom? I think it was advanced in somebody that I read by Raghu Ramrakhan, uh, noticing that initially the uh, boards uh, were decided as they are because it wasn't so easy to convene meetings uh, with members of uh, not necessarily the ministers and their secretaries, etc. He says, well, now it is different, but certainly, if not the boards, uh, here the ministerial committee that is in charge of the IMF should play a role uh, somehow of, uh, uh, of global governance. Not only this, here Europe, and I finish, is called upon to be unitarian as much as possible. Having all of these European states uh, with their own seats and their own shares is a real nonsense, is a real nonsense. Some of us have been repeating for years that uh, the European Union would be the first shareholder of the IMF should we decide to uh, join in uh, the uh, uh, use of our uh, shares. But at the moment, uh, we don't go beyond coordination. My final point is the following. Uh, this is very difficult. Perhaps it's the first time that something is feasible, because the crisis is so deep with consequences that are so demanding in terms of new action, of innovations, etc., that few opportunities in history have appeared in the past that are so, uh, I mean, promising in terms of uh, badly needed uh, uh, reforms. But will our governments find the time to take care of this is my only, now I found it very encouraging what Fred said initially about his exchange with President Obama this morning, because it, it, it means that he has this in mind. And, and, and this is extremely important because the domestic pressure might be such that they have to consume their energies and their time in solving the domestic side of these issues, arriving to the global one already exhausted and with another uh, agenda to take care of for the future. So this is my main concern today. This is an issue that requires uh, uh, an enormous attention at the global level. This is the time for us to produce something more than, than words in terms of global quasi-governance, not global governance. This is a time where domestic pressures are so high 
that those who could decide about the global matters might not find the time to do it. And therefore, let us perhaps be the lobby in favor of it uh, because it's needed and it might also be productive.